worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His power and His love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with grace. O tell of His might, O sing of His grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, His chariots of wrath, a deep thunder clouds form, and dark is His path on the wings of the nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. Amen. Amen. It sure is a friend yes, that sticketh yes, closer than a brother. Amen. All right, then. Uh, our red hymn books turn to page 483. 483. <clears throat> I want to try not to forget this song, so we're going to sing this again, 483. Oh, yes, how I love Jesus. Yes, sir. Amen. All right. We're going to skip verse 3 for time's sake. Verse 3, we will skip again for time's sake. Here we go. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, so oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of His precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because He first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Sing it! Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Because He first loved me. And because of that, we have victory. Turn yes, to 496. 496. Let me tell you of an old, old story and how I got the victory. All right. 496. Here we go. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory! And cause the blind to see, and 
then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and Thank brought you, to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me. streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story, and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He saw and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Amen. Brother Roger, would you open up the service with a word of prayer, please? <coughs> God, thank you for this beautiful warm Sunday afternoon. Thank you for getting everyone here safely today. We have gathered us believers here today and ask those who are honestly seeking the truth. Guide our worship this hour. Speak to us as whole people today. May your truth touch not just our intellects but also our deeper yearnings of heart. That's good. Yes. So Amen. We bring with us our daily concerns as well as our more eternal questions. May your new creation in us shed light upon our everyday walk. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You, may be seated. you may be seated. Page 57. Page 57, your white hymn book. 57. Uh, we'll sing page 58, actually, for time's sake, 58. All right. How many of you are saved through Jesus' blood? Yeah. All right. 58 in your white hymn books. Here we go. Sometime we'll stand before the judgment bar, the quick, the risen dead. The Lord will then make known the record there, our names will all be read. I'll be present when the roll is called, pure and spotless through the crimson flood. I will answer when they call my name. Saved through Jesus' blood, I'll then receive a bright and starry crown as only God can give. And when I've been with him ten thousand years, I'll have no less to live. I'll be present when the roll is called, I'll be pure and spotless through the crimson flood. to never part again, our toil will then be your. We'll lay our burdens down at Jesus' feet and rest forevermore. I'll be present when the roll is called, pure and spotless through the crimson flood. I will answer when they call my name. Saved through Jesus' blood. Are you saved through Jesus' yes, blood? Amen. Amen. All right, if Tom can come forward with the announcements for us, if he can come forward here and do the announcements for us. I shall if you'll have me. Morning, church. Good morning. Uh, love all you guys. I, like, I love seeing you guys at church. It's a good day. It's a good day every day. Oh, man. 
It was hot today. It was a gr- it was a great day. We went street preaching to preach about the <laughs> the horrors of a burning hell. But you know what? Today is also a good day to go soul winning. So that's what we did. Um, just one important thing: this upcoming Sunday, Pastor will not be here. So it, it'll be me and Sean taking charge of the service. So if you'll Amen. if you'll suffer us, we will be here. <laughs> Please pray for us. Please. Amen. Please pray. Please. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't trust us, so please pray. Amen. Yeah, I don't trust myself either. <laughs> so next Sunday, we're going to have street preaching. I got all the signs in my car. We'll still be doing street preaching. Amen. It's, we're not going to skip out. We're going to do street preaching. Amen. It's going to be 1030 at the same place at the Chevron Corner. Monday Bible study is going to be at 8 p.m. It's going to be tomorrow. Discipleship at 7 p.m. as always. Um, we're going to have a missionary drop by. Missionary Hanson will be dropping by our church on July 29th. Mark that in your calendar. It's going to be pretty interesting. He's going to be here. Um, and so our memory verse is going to be Psalms chapter 8. I think we left off at, we're going to be probably doing verses 5 to 6 this time. I think we did 3 to 4 last time. Um, Psalms chapter 8, verses 5 through 6. And the Bible says, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Man, praise God he let us eat cows. Because <laughs> I love beef, amen. <laughs> put all things under our feet, amen. <laughs> and the next verse says, yea, all sheep and oxen. So that, that'll be next week. So you don't have to memorize that this time. <laughs> so you won't, have to, you, won't, you won't have to remember that this time. But this week it's going to be verses 5 through 6, amen. Amen. And now we're going to have a special. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. Then I know the sins of earth beset on every hand. Doubt and fear and things of earth in vain to me are calling. None of these shall move me. From Beulah land, I'm living on the mountain, underneath a cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. Far below the storm of doubt upon the world is beating. Sons of men in battle along the enemy withstand. Safe am I within the castle of God's word retreating. Nothing then can reach me this land. I'm living on the mountain underneath a cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. Viewing here the works of God, I sink in contemplation. Hearing now his blessed voice, I see the way he planned. Dwelling in the Spirit here, I learn a full salvation. Gladly will I tarry in Beulah land. I'm living on the mountain underneath a cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply. For I am dwelling in Beulah land. Okay, so we're going to take up the Lord's offering. If Brother Daniel can come forward, take up the Lord's offering for us. And then ask God's blessing upon the church service with a word of prayer as well. Uh, Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us here on another great Sunday. Amen. Uh, We just want to uh, just 
thank you for everything you do for us, continue to do for us, uh, in the present and in the future. Also, we'd like you to bless this offering that our church is offering to you, and let it be used in, for the glory of your name. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 We'll look at 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 12, please. 1 Samuel chapter 2. And we will read verse 12. You heard about our memory verse. The only thing I learned out of that verse was thank God for cows, right? <laughs> I'm going to be talking about that, actually. All right. So because I have such good sirloin steak, no one should eat it bless God. It should be mine and mine alone. And that's Preach. and you Amen. need that selfish, you need that kind of selfish, arrogant attitude where you don't believe in sharing your stake with anybody. Amen. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest. For he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. You got to realize that you have a stake that is only belonging to you and if somebody else comes forward and tries to steal that stake from you men of belial as this passage said hophni and phineas these two sons of the high priest eli they wanted to steal the meat the sacrifice from these people who are offering it to the Lord. And that offering was theirs. It was between them and God. Them and God. Yep. And no one had the right, no son of Belial, as the word described Hophni and Phinehas, sons of Belial had no right to steal that offering that was only between them and God. And you got to realize that that stake that God has given to you, it's only between you and God. Only God has the right to give and to take it away. No one has the right to steal. No son of Belial in this earth should have the right to steal and rob your stake. But we are living in a day and age where we allow sons of Belial to steal our meat. And because of that, you lose your joy in the Lord. You're robbed of your blessing. You feel depressed and sad, and all you want to do is let the sons of Belial, the sons of Belial, take away the offering. Take away the blessing. Take away your stake. My title is Hands Off My Stake. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, fill within me the power of your spirit. Wash away my sins with your blood. God, you know that I need you more than ever for this message, and I pray that you'll soften people's hearts. I pray they'll be open to this message, that you'll convict them, change their lives. Kick out any son of Belial out of this room today, Lord, and may your Holy Spirit reign full and free and full control. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. First Samuel chapter 2, let's start off at verse 12. Notice the word of God reads, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial, Look at this. They knew not the Lord. You got to realize sons of Belial, whose hands are going to rob your stake, they don't know God. And I think that's a problem. We allow sons of Belial coming in, stealing our stake, and we don't realize that those sons of Belial don't know the Lord. I think that's the problem nowadays. 
My first point is, do you allow strangers? Do you allow strangers? See, we allow such strangers, something that's not between you and God, some outsider, some invader, some stranger to come in and steal your steak. But you allow those strangers to come in. Romans 14 verse 22 says, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. See, the problem, as Paul stated, is that we allow things that condemn us. And see, you allow these strangers to come in and bring you condemnation to rob your stake. That stake that you have, this church, your salvation, the Bible in your hand, the money you got, the loved ones that you have, the roof over your head. Satan wants you to stop enjoying the meal while you're eating it. He wants to replace it instead with covetousness and pride, bitterness, complaining attitude, etc. So that those things can steal your stake, your time to enjoy that stake. And those are sons of Belial and you gotta understand this, those things don't know the Lord. Depression does not know the Lord. Yep. Covetousness right. does not know the Lord. The world does not know the Lord. Yep. Your suffering does not know the Lord. So because of that, why do you allow such strangers to come in, invade you, and make you forget the Lord? Amen. That's good. They don't know the Lord. Did you think that when you yielded into the world and enjoyed it, that uh, you, those things, that you can serve God and mammon? You can have the world and God together? Or didn't they, didn't they not know the Lord and made you not know the Lord? And you forgot the preach and you forgot the conviction. You forgot the Bible, what the Bible said. You forgot the Holy Spirit speaking in your heart. See, we allow such things to rob our stake. One of the things that robs our stake is sin. And I don't know what kind of sin that you're struggling in your life, but isn't it true that because you're still struggling with those certain kind of sins in your life, that they have robbed your time to enjoy the stake that God has given to you? Those sins in your life that you're struggling with made you miss out the blessing of fellowship in church, the stuff. communion with God in His Word and prayer, made you even neglect to enjoy the things with your family and in your home because those sins just destroyed your household, destroyed your life, destroyed even your job situation, destroyed your schedules and plan, destroyed, most important of all, your relationship with God and spending time with the brethren. You allowed sin and you allowed the stranger of sin to rob your stakes. Neglect of spiritual duties. You allowed that other stranger in. You just neglected reading the Bible, neglected prayer, you neglected coming to church, you neglected talking to people how to get saved, you neglected to memorize the scriptures, and you could have enjoyed, finally known the pleasure with the Lord of walking and talking with Him in the garden, of getting that wicked mind filtered out by spending communion with God and with the brethren, and because you neglected those spiritual duties, it robbed you of being happy in the Lord of what it's like to read the Bible. Of what it's like to shout and praise God and singing again. Of what it's like to come down on the altar with conviction and pouring out your heart to Him. You've lost that enjoyment, that time, those stakes that God has given to you because you allow neglect of spiritual duties. Those sons of Belial, that, those wicked sons of Belial, they don't know the Lord. And you got to realize this, when you neglect reading your Bible, remember that neglect does not know the Lord. Neglect never plays fairly. Neglect will not give you the chance to think you about, to make you think about God. They don't know the Lord. Did you think that indifference would make you know the Lord? Indifference does not know the Lord. That's why we have people today, when they come to church and hear the preaching, they're indifferent. They don't get conviction. They don't laugh. They don't cry. They don't react toward anything. They're just thinking, oh yeah, just another sermon. Just another dry sermon. When can we leave? Indifference. No wonder they don't know the Lord. Do, do you know the Lord? Yes, sir. When you come to church and hear the preaching, 
You don't know the Lord, right? Because of indifference. Because indifference does not know the Lord. You got to realize that the stranger, that son of Belial named indifference, does not know the Lord. It knows worldly music. It knows worldly conversation. It knows worldly entertainment. It knows worldly thrills. And it will give you indifference toward the things of God, make you think that's another dry religion, and you will not know the Lord. Busyness does not know the Lord. Because can I get a raise of hands? When's the last time you thought about your memory verse when you're doing this with your workplace? Amen. When, when did you say, man, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul from hell when you were studying for a final exam? See, busyness does not know the Lord. That wicked son of Belial does not know the Lord. And do you think that while you're busy that you will not neglect your spiritual duties? Or will you fall behind in church attendance, Bible reading, prayer, and memory verse? And when's the last time you ever led a soul to salvation? Months ago? Years ago? You know why? It does not know the Lord. Busyness does not know the Lord. Did you ever thought that they would kind of know the Lord? That you would kind of remember about the Lord? No, busyness robbed you and made you not know the Lord, did it not? You allowed strangers coming in and made you not know the Lord. You got to realize that depression never knows the Lord. Depression never knows the Lord about God who provides your needs, a God who loves you, a God who provides you what's best in your life despite of the hardship, despite of the trial, despite of the suffering, despite of some sad things in your life. Depression does not know the Lord. That's why people come inside church when something bad happened to them. And when they come to church, they don't feel intimate with God. You know why? Depression does not know the Lord. Depression does not know the Lord. You will, you will not allow that son of Belial, that wicked stranger, rob you of your joy in enjoying that steak while you're going through suffering. God has given you a wonderful promise that you'll be happy, not just in good times, but in bad, bad times. What a wonderful promise that he promised to give you happiness even in bad times. But you rejected that steak. You didn't take opportunity to eat and enjoy that steak. Instead, you allowed depression to come in. And depression does not know the Lord. And depression ate up your steak. It ate up your joy. It ate up your happiness. It ate up your positive mindset. It ate up your motivation. It ate up your encouraging yourself in the Lord. It ate up your praise and hallelujahs to the Lord. You allow depression, that stranger, to come in and eat your steak. Nitpickiness, definitely nitpickiness, does not know the Lord. You know why? Because when you're finding things to critique while you're eating that steak, that steak does not taste as good, does it? Oh, it needs a little bit more A1 sauce. Oh, it needs to turn a little red. It needs to turn a little black. Or, you know, the steak is too small. And shut up, man. Enjoy shit. Sit down and enjoy eating your steak. You know, the, it's so easy to have a nitpicky attitude with, oh, you know, like, my Christian life is small. I didn't have enough fruits for the Lord. Bad things are happening to me. Oh, the brethren are not as perfect as I thought. Oh, God is not blessing me as much. God's not working out at the timing like I wanted. And just shut up and sit down and eat your steak. God has given you a steak to eat and enjoy, and that nitpicky attitude robbed you of your joy. Amen. When I come to church, I'm... I am not going to allow that nitpicky attitude of mine or, oh, so-and-so here, so-and-so there, and bad things here in my life, and bad things there, and, oh, it's so small. I don't want to do that. Then I'll never enjoy preaching to you. I'll never enjoy teaching to you. I will never enjoy reaching people out there around the world with fruits. I will never enjoy soul winning and winning a soul to salvation. Shut up that nitpicky attitude, and I'm going to sit down and eat my steak. And I hope you're enjoying your steak right now, bless God. Don't let that son of Belial... That son of Belial, nitpickiness, is sitting right next to you, isn't it? And here you are listening to the sermon, and nitpickiness is eating up your steak, and you're just letting him eat it, and you're just going like this, getting offended and, you know, mad, and then there you go, that nitpickiness, he's eating up your steak, and he's enjoying it, man. You poured out that A1 sauce all over for him to eat. No, you you got to kick Mr. Nitpickiness out of your seat. 
And you should sit down and enjoy your steak right now, bless God. Laziness does not know the Lord. Do you think laziness knows the Lord? No, laziness does not lo know the Lord. Laziness, what it will do, it will shut off your functions on your sharp attitude on what to do to serve God. That's what it will do. Laziness is the, one of the biggest things that I notice in America is television. But now it's switching to internet. Those things, do you know how, mu how many hours an average American spends time watching that kind of stuff? And I'll include social media and video games right here. And for our online people, YouTube, I'll include that right there. Anything that has to do with the screen, those things do not know the Lord. And you will not think about God when you're seeing somebody cussing on a screen. You will not God. think about God when your function, the senses of your body are being entertained and it feels good and runs through with the emotions with whatever the next clip of the scene will show. It, you will not think about God. You can't think about God because laziness does not know the Lord. If, you, if you're slothful and you take long naps, if you're lazy where you don't do your work but you sit down and play video games, if you're lazy where you want to spend time where, it can, where you can enjoy the sensations of your body rather than what God has given to you, laziness does not know the Lord and it will eat our number one, our number two, our number three, our number four, and you will give the excuse that, oh, I forgot to read my Bible and prayer. You wouldn't have if you did not allow laziness to rob your stake. That's good preaching. That's good. Poor time management definitely robs your stake. You know, we, we live in America and everyone has the excuse of, I am too busy. I got so many things in my schedule. I got this going on. And I never heard more excuses in my life than in a Bible believing church. You know why? Because God wants you to do something for him, but we always say, but this, but that, something here, something there. You got to realize this. I'm not condemning anyone if they're truly busy or they only had a few hours of sleep or they don't have that much money or there's something bad going on in their household. But you can't allow those sons of Belial be your excuse to eat your steak. It's like as if you want to find an excuse to let poor time management eat your steak. Do you want them to eat your steak? Well, I want to come to soul winning, but, and then you mentioned this. Well, don't let that happen then. Don't let poor time management eat up your steak. You got to pray for the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom. Look at your schedule again. Squeeze in every minute and second where you can spend time using those hours to benefit God and you so that you can finally enjoy your steak that God has blessed you with. Poor health care. A lot of people allow poor health care to come in and rob them of their stake. That's why they can't come out to street preaching anymore. That's why they can't preach anymore. That's why they can't soul win anymore. That's why they can't even come to church anymore. You know why? Because they take poor care of their health when they should be taking care of their diet. They should be taking proper exercise. And because of that, oh, I'm sick. Oh, I'm hurt. Oh, I can't do this for God anymore. You allow those things now to rob you of your fruit, your gold, your silver, and precious stones, and the blessings God could have given to you of actually winning a soul right in front of your face, of experiencing the joy with the brethren. You know why? Because you allow poor health care to rob your steak. I can't tell you how many times, how many elderly people I see and it grieves my heart where they want to come to church, they want to serve God, but because of problems in their health, they can't come anymore. And that really grieves me. And I know it grieves them more than it grieves me. And you got to realize this, you're going to become one of them one day. And when you become one of them one day, you don't want to be the person where because you took care of your health poorly that you ended up that way. That's good. People, we allow people to rob our stake. Man, ain't this hymn good to sing to the Lord? And some person says, oh, it's okay. And then just, you just lost your joy. You let that person rob your stake. Who cares if the person doesn't like singing the hymn that we're singing today? You just say, I love this song. And if the person doesn't like it, then let him not enjoy his stake and you enjoy yours. Don't let people rob you of your stake. Here are these 
so-called friends, oh, come out with us and party and do this kind of stuff. And they drag you down to the world or to sin, and they rob your stake of holiness, of sanctification, of purity, and God blessing you in your life. You allow people, sometimes, pe sometimes you allow your family members, your lover, your children, your so-called friends, and even fellow Bible believers in a Bible-believing church rob you of your stake. You can't let anyone and not allow anyone to rob you of your stake. Amen. And you sit down and enjoy that stake. And what are you doing? You're taking out a knife and a fork and you're dividing the portion to everybody. Don't divide the portion. Take it to yourself and you eat it. Be selfish like a hog and eat your steak and don't share it with, oh, my husband, he needs a steak. Oh, my wife needs a steak. Because I love my best friend and my friend, because I care for them, God understands. Let them enjoy the steak like with me. They rob your steak. We allow satanic attacks to rob us of our stake. Those sons of Belial, see Satan, he is not happy when you led a soul to salvation. Right. When you came to San Jose Bible Baptist Church, some of you have been searching truth for years and the right kind of fruits in church for years and you finally got it. Satan don't like it. So now he sends in, and you know I'm right because I'm seeing it with several people in our church that Satan sends in some kind of personal problem in your life. It's attacking your household, your work, somebody else in your life. It's attacking here and there. Money's running out. Your health is getting cracked. Satan just sends in something and you're like, why is this happening? This didn't happen before. Why is this all happening? You know why? Satan doesn't want you to enjoy the steak after you've been searching for many years. He doesn't want you to enjoy your steak, and he wants you to give up. You know what Satan's doing while you're eating your steak? Satan, he's hurting you. Health problem, financial problem, mental problems, church problems, family problems. And he just keeps harassing you, right? He's like, he's like bothering you, harassing you, and saying, give me that steak, give me that steak. And you know what you're doing? You're eating your steak, and you're hanging on to your steak as best as you can. Be and you're trying to enjoy your steak, but you can't enjoy it because of that harasser keeping, keeping in, on your back, nagging about, give me the steak, give me the steak. And finally, we have some Bible-believing Christians, bless their heart, and it's so sad, they finally say, okay, I give up. You're bothering me. Here's my steak, Satan. You can have it and eat it. I refuse, by the grace of God, I'm only human and I'm flesh. That's why I will say sometimes that I can quit because I am flesh. I don't want to underestimate the devil's power. But by the grace of God, that quitting would be the last thing on my mind. And I can't imagine myself saying, here's the stake, Satan, after working so hard here. You can have it. I refuse to let that demonic being who wanted me to burn in hell to enjoy my steak. My second point, do you allow sacrifice? Do you allow sacrifice? Look at verses 13 through 14. Verses 13 through 14. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand, and he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Notice right here that these people, when they're enjoying their meat offering to give it to the Lord, they offered it as a sacrifice. And you got to realize this, your meat is something you sacrifice to the Lord. It was something between only you and God that you worked so hard for. Do you remember all the hard times and the struggles and the sweat and the tears you went through just so that you can attain finally that stake that the Lord has finally given? put on your plate and now you're gonna give it up and throw it away to that wicked one you sacrifice but people forget that Psalms 119 verse 61 reads the bands of the wicked have robbed me but I have not forgotten thy law see those robbers they're trying to steal from you right now but during those moments when they're trying to rob your stake you gotta say I will not forget 
thy law, Lord. Amen. I won't forget all the hard times that, and the sacrifice that I did for so many years. These past days already, i worked so hard for it. And finally, I have the steak. I absolutely refuse for those robbers now to enjoy my steak. Can you imagine that you work so hard in a job, you put long hours to it so that you can finally enjoy a nice vacation trip and some person just stole all your salary money? Yeah, that's good, that's good. That's what you're doing right now. You're working so hard and God has given you that vacation, that blessing, that joy, and you forgot about it. You forgot about it and you just surrendered your hard work and sacrifice and years of labor to that wicked one, to sons of Belial who know not the Lord. Can't you imagine that after you've been searching for Bible-believing truth for years, you've been searching for how can I know the truth? I'm going through this church and I watch this stuff out online and I've heard this pastor say this and I've tried different religions and how many years did it took for some of you? How long did it take for some of you? And then you've been begging the Lord, Lord, will you give me some light? Will you give me some truth? And then finally you just bumped into this church out of nowhere and you're like, okay, this is just one of the many churches. Might as well try this one. And you finally got your stake. Yes, sir. Some of you have been searching stuff online this, yeah. online that, and for some random weird reason, we just popped out of somewhere, out of nowhere, and you watched it and you finally got your stake. And after all of that, now you're enjoying the... Bible-believing truth. You've heard doctrines you never heard before. Things that really helped you in your life. Hey. Dispensational truth that made the Bible so much sense. Yeah. Reading the Bible now became something that you can understand now with common sense. Now you realize why every word in the King James Bible was perfect and everything was wrong. Yeah. God turned, transformed your darkness into light and you want to throw yourself back into the darkness. You want to give up all of that after all of that sacrifice and hard work and you want the devil to bring you back again to the wrong kind of church, to the wrong kind of video channel, to the wrong kind of people? That does not make sense. Will you not remember how hard you sacrifice to get your steak? And will you not just sit down and eat your steak like a good boy and like a good girl and enjoy it? Didn't you work so hard to cook it on a pan? And you put all the dressing and everything and you spent so much careful time with it because you and Jesus, the king chef, made that steak perfect at the right time when you can get that blessing, when you can get that right fruit. And now that it's right, now that you got it, you forgot it. And you let the devil steal and eat it. You know what Satan's doing? He's just sitting back while you're working your tail off. That's and he's right. like, that's right, that's keep winning the soul. That's right, yeah, keep listening to the Bible-believing truth. Keep watching, Pastor Kim. I'm going to wait for that right time when that steak and that fruit is so perfect. And then I'm going to come in and steal it off your plate. Oh, I didn't like that preaching. Oh, I, I don't like that teaching. Or, oh, something happened to my church. And, oh, so many bad things are happening to my life. And you let the devil rob it and eat it. You can't allow that. How many of you have been, how long was it since you finally got saved, huh? Some of you did not get saved for years, right? And it's some of you, most people actually here, took a while for you to finally have the assurance of, I can now know for 100% fact that I'll go to heaven after I die. Some of you were just lost in sin and ignorance. You didn't care what was going to happen to you in the afterlife. Some of you... Never had a second thought about hell. Some of you were scared and fearful about hell. Some of you tried to find, I want to go to heaven, but I can't find it over there. And finally, you got the chance. And what a stake. What a stake that God has given to you. It's so easy to get saved. You can have it right here, right now, yeah. by the blood of Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. And here you are getting the stake. And Satan wants you to be robbed of your joy in your salvation. Yeah. He doesn't want you to enjoy your saved life life in Jesus Christ. He wants you to doubt your salvation. He wants you to regret being a saved Bible-believing Christian. He wants you to think that if I was not serving God, if I was not saved, it would have been easy like I was back in Egypt, said the Israelites. You brought us out here in the wilderness to die. I remember the garlic and the good herbs and the fish in Egypt. What, you want to go back to be a slave? The dark days when you are lost in sin in wicked Egypt rather than enjoying your salvation 
salvation in Jesus Christ. What, you want to go back? You want to go back to that wrong religion? That wrong yeah. church? The ones who put too many restrictions on your salvation and could not give you the joy of your salvation? You want to go back to that? You want robbers to steal your stake of salvation where Jesus bled and died for you. That was not a cheap gift. Amen. Amen. That's right. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. See, you're, you're sowing, you're sowing, you're giving out all that sacrifice of the seeds outside in the hot sun, like today, amen. amen. Spreading out those seeds in singing specials, in attending church, in encouraging people to keep attending, and then maintaining your own spiritual walk. Don't be weary in that. In due season, you will reap if you faint not. At the right time, at the right place, God will make you enjoy the fruit. So, what, so it does not make sense if you think back after all the years of sacrifice you went through, bad things happening in your household, yet you maintained your integrity in the Lord, the worldly and sinful things that you gave up to serve God, it does not make sense that after all that sacrifice, one bad thing happens and you go, I give up. That does not make sense. It does not make sense if you have a few bad things right now, if you're going through a few bad things right now, it does not make sense that right now, in the moment, which is present tense and temporary, those few things rob you of all those years of what you sacrificed for God. That does not make sense. If you think that one health problem, one family problem, if you think that a few household problems, if you think that a few financial problems, if you think that a few church problems, and if you think that a few little sufferings here and there in your life, few problems in your workplace, few problems in your schooling, few problems in your life, if those things are enough, if those things are enough to overthrow all the years that you sweated and cried and walked with Jesus and prayed with Him and put your faith in Him and sacrificed this and that, you bled yourself, you shot your shotguns, you swung your sword, you kept sowing seed, you struck down Goliath here and Goliath's brother there and Goliath's three other brothers there and then you overthrow all of that and give all that up because of one health problem, one financial problem, one family problem, one church problem, and a few little problems right now, then overthrow it, waste it, throw it in the garbage can. Not worth it. Not worth it. Amen. I absolutely refuse by the grace of God that these few things I'm going on in my life, few things that are going on in this church, that that will be enough to Amen. overthrow what we've sweated, what we prayed, yes. all our years of attendance and prayer, all the tracks we passed. Yes. My third point is, do you allow spoiling? Do you allow spoiling? Look at verse 15, please. Look at verse 15. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Now look at this. Notice that these wicked sons of Belial, you know when they came in to steal the offering? Came to steal the steak? This is the best part of the steak. You can disagree with me. That's fine, all right? All right. Pastor, I disagree with you on those weird stuff you teach about doctrines and those deep things. Okay. You can disagree with me on this one, all right? I think the fat part of the steak is the best part. Amen. Hey, man. If you want to split church or, you know, unsubscribe after this or walk out of the church, I don't like that doctrine. That's fine, okay? I think the steak, the fat, bless God, is the best part of the yeah. steak. And here comes that son of Belial when he sees that fat. And that fat is only between you and God. I'm going to make sure that God, between me and God, it's going to be this fat that's burnt. And here comes that wicked one. That goes for the best part of the steak. The fat part of the steak. And you got to realize this. That's what sin, the world, the flesh, and suffering from satanic attacks will do. 
They will come in at the time when you're at the best part. They want the best choice parts of your meat. That's what they want. And they want to eat up and enjoy the best parts that God has planned out for you. Because Romans 8.28, God doesn't just give you a steak or a good steak or a better steak. He gives you the best steak that fits in your character, in your level, at the right timing, at the right circumstances. He gives that best one to you and Satan wants it for himself. And we know that all things, according to Romans 8, 28, work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Are you saved in the Lord Jesus Christ? Then every single one of you, God has a beautiful and a wonderful plan that's very different from everybody in this room and everybody around the world, only to you, just you and Him, He's got a wonderful plan, a beautiful plan, the best plan ever that fits perfectly for you and not for other people. The thing that he knows will give you the right kind of joy, the right kind of contentment, the right kind of holiness, and the right kind of overall happiness, the right kind of reward. And Satan, he wants your steak. Because he's not content with steak number one. He wants a variety of all the best steaks in the world. He wants a variety because he's a hungry, roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And guess what? Once he eats up the best fat off your steak, you think he's done with you? Oh, you know, uh, I pulled through, through this suffering. And then what? Another one lands in from Satan. Another attack, right? Why? Because you got to use some common sense here. This satanic being is not going to say, I'll leave you alone after eating your fat. He wants the next fat that you're preparing on your pan where you and Jesus are working it out together. Another Sunday, another week, another labor for him, pulling through another week. And there is that steak almost ready. And Satan wants that next one. He's not content. And you got to realize this, that the best plan God has given to you, God, Satan wants to take it away. He wants to take away San Jose Bible Baptist Church out of your life. He wants to take away your husband and your wife. Yeah. He wants to take away your children. Right. He wants to take away your brother and sister in Christ Amen. in Amen. this church. He wants to take away the joy that you had in the Lord with singing a hymn. The joy that you had with the Lord in reading the Bible. The joy that you had with the Lord in praying to Him. Right. The joy that yeah. you had in the Lord with soul winning. He wants to steal all that knowledge that you... Uh, with all the services that you attended, all the notes that you've written out, all the disciple class, all the disciple classes that you've been attending, he wants to eat up all that knowledge out of you, and he wants so much more out of your life. Yeah. And you must realize that the best parts and the better parts you cannot allow. You cannot allow for sons of Belial to steal and to eat it up. You're going to let poor time management eat it up, huh? Now you're going to allow laziness to eat it up. Now you're going to allow busyness to finally eat it up. You're going to keep going on with depression and depression and let Mr. Depression eat 20 steaks by now? Are you still going to neglect after years of your spiritual duties? You're going to let Mr. Neglect keep keep eating more years off of your steak? Or is it about time that you got sick and tired and you never enjoyed the fat You've heard the preacher and the Word of God saying there's pure 100% joy in serving God. And you never tasted that fat part yet, didn't you? You were just enjoying certain portions and getting that steak ready, but you never got to it because the devil, poor time, time management, depression, sin, neglect, and laziness always ate the fat. Did you ever try the fat with God yet? Some of you didn't, didn't you? You don't know how good that fat part tastes. You know why? You gave it up. You gave it up to sin. You gave it up to Mr. World. You gave it up to Mr. Flesh. You gave it up to Mr. Satan. You let sons of Belial, strangers who don't know the Lord, who you don't know from Adam, you let them eat it. When's the last time that you were close? Don't say summer camp, please. 
don't say that that was the time that you were the closest to enjoying the fat. Don't say that. The fat should be in every moment of your life. You know why? You allowed sons of Belial's to eat your fat. Don't do it. Some of you are skinny as a rail. You got to be fat in Jesus Christ. You got to be a big boy and gain weight and just keep eating and eating. You got to be fat in Jesus Christ. So fat that the Holy Spirit will come out. The Holy Spirit should fill up so much in you that out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. Right? That's how it should be. My third point. Yeah, yeah, that was probably the Holy Spirit. I don't know. Maybe that was flesh. I don't know. But do you, do you allow spoiling? My third point. My third point. Do you allow spoiling? Do you allow spoiling? That was the third point. And you allowed those wicked ones to spoil and eat up the best parts. And you don't want to, want to allow that because 1 John 2, 17 says, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 through 9, Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. See, Satan knows that those other parts of the stake that are just really small and little snippets of it, they're not really good meat. And Satan, he offers that to you. He offers you the scraps and the bones, the dog meat, and says, isn't this world beautiful? Don't what I offer to you is awesome? That's good. Take it. But John warns you, it's so small, it's so temporary. The world passeth away and the lust thereof. But doing the will of God is eternal. And you got a never-ending stake. And Satan wants you to give that to him. He wants to do a trade-off. And he wants you to take the scrap and the bones, not that delicious, never-ending stake. He wants you to give it to him. You know why? Because you're going to be ruling his kingdom. Didn't you know that? You're going to be reigning for a thousand years and for all eternity. You're the one who got saved by the blood. You're the one going to heaven. Satan can't go to heaven, Satan is not saved by the blood, and Satan can't rule on this earth forever. It will be gone. And he knows you're going to take that place. Weak, pathetic, frail human beings that Satan could just snapped with two little fingers. And he knows you're going to get it. So he w doesn't want you to enjoy that stake. He wants you to be as miserable as him, or even close. You ain't going to rule this part of the city, Gene. It's mine, says Satan. So I offer you this, the scrap, the dog meat, and the bones right here. Why don't you waste your time on those things so that you don't rule and eat my steak, says the devil. See, you're so deceived. You think there's something better. That's why you allow the enemies to spoil you. Yep, that's good. But you got to realize this. Satan has always deceived you. And is there anything better than God? There is nothing better than God. And that's why you allow the enemy to spoil your state. Because you believe. You believe. See, deep down inside your heart, you believe. There's something better out there than what God has given to you now. And Satan, he will make you enjoy it. He will dull your senses and blind your eyes to deceive you, making you think that this heroin really feels good. But when you look outside of the picture of heroin and look all around you, you're in rags, you're in poverty, you, you haven't bathed in days, your family's broken up, you're all miserable. There's this drug of heroin called Satan, Satan's offer. Satan's offer, whatever heroin it is, it deceives you into thinking, this is great, this is wonderful. And you don't look outside of the picture and realize you're poor, miserable, blind, and naked. My fourth point, do you allow scorning? My fourth point, <clears throat> do you allow scorning? Look at verse 17. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. For men abhorred the offering of the Lord. That's the saddest thing. Here is your stake. That's just you and God. 
and now you scorn it? Now you abhor it? Do you know how many saved Christians out there scorn what God has given to them? And they're feasting on the bones and the dog meat and letting Satan rob them blind. Jeremiah 2.25, it says, Withhold thy foot from being unshod, and thy throat from thirst. But thou saidest, There is no hope, no, for I have loved strangers, and after them will I go. You know what your problem is? Wow, can you imagine this? Here's that stake that God has given to you. Here is Jesus Christ opening up his arms. And here you are, you have the option. You've always been there, see? You could just sit down and keep enjoying the steak. But here's the devil right there and saying, all of these kingdoms and the glory of it will I offer. Come over here. And you know what you did? You abhorred, you abhorred, you hated, you scorned what God has given to you and pushed Jesus away, threw away that stake, ran to the arms of the devil, and you basically said, I love you. That's too strong, Pastor. No, you basically, you got to realize this. You realize if you don't like the things of God, then what do you like then? Anything else outside of God is something the devil wants you to do. Anything outside of God is something the devil wants you to do. He wants you to always get out of that straight and narrow path. He always wants you to violate and break one part of God's rules and law. Because one sin is enough to condemn you completely, you got to understand. As the book of James chapter 2 said, Satan wants anything outside of God, and he wants you to love what he's offered to you than what Jesus has offered to you. He wants you. You to think he's a better caregiver and father than what Jesus can offer. You don't think like that. You, you never thought about that. But guess what? Your heart felt it. Your heart always believed those things were better. Right now what I'm going through is not better. I don't like this. See, you love something else. And you automatically despise the offering the state that Jesus has given to you. Psalms, Psalms chapter 119 and verse 128, it reads, Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate, I hate every false way. You scorned God's stake long enough. You scorned what God has given to you long enough. Shouldn't we transform the, those emotions? I think what will be helpful to you where you can enjoy the steak rather than coveting and almost loving where your love is growing closer and closer to the world in order to stop that. I think you should transform it where you don't see the beauty of the world but the ugliness of the world. I think you could, should see it where you don't see it as a good thing, as a smooth and comfortable thing. You should see it as a hardship and a tragic and a painful thing. You should transform it. So basically, what you should do is if those emotions of love start to stir up toward what Satan has offered to you, you should automatically replace that with hatred. That's what you should be doing. And before you commit that sin, before you fall into the world, before you give in to the devil, if the emotion of, yeah, that feels better. Oh, that looks better. Yeah, that tastes better. Oh, I want that. No, it should transform into, I hate that. Amen. Why did I even see that? Why did I even think about that? What in the world? How can I see the beauty of those things? That is ugly as hell. And Amen. if your hatred Amen. grows, it would tend for you not to fall into those wicked things and those worldly things and those attractable offers that Satan has given and sprinkled all over to you. If you saw the ugliness of it, then you would run away from it. I mean, if you saw how ugly that, and gross that dog bone was, Look how empty that is. Look how temporary that is. Look how unfulfilling that is. Look how small that thing has 
to offer to me compared to eternity what God has offered to me. And you would say, that is sick. That is growth. Satan, you can eat the dog bone because that's what you're eating at the millennium when you rot in the bottomless pit. I refuse. I refuse to eat that dog bone with you. I want my steak. I want to enjoy my steak. Start to hate what you think. Start to hate what you talk about. Start to hate what has wasted your time with God. Good, Start hating what you're seeing. Start hating what you're wearing. Start hating what you're hearing. Start hating those things, what you're tasting. And when you start to hate and hate and hate, then you will never fall into the things that Satan has tried to make your heart covet and to love. To combat love, you need hate. And you need to hate your flesh. You need to hate that world. You need to hate that devil. And not just now. You need to hate it when the emotion of love starts to rush into your body. And when the emotion of love starts to rush in your body, you got to start hating that and say, this is sick. This is growth. You're disgusting. And I hate this. And if you hate it, then you know what you're doing? You're embracing Satan all that time and you st try to see the beauty of it just like the world's doing. They're trying to make Satan innocent. They're trying to make false religions look nice. They're trying to make wrong doctrines something that's not as evil. They're trying to make sin more pleasurable and pleasurable. And you need to realize that instead of blinding yourself where you see how lovely the devil is and you start to keep hugging him, you got to realize, what? This is gr Look at the slime off his back. This is gross. What am I hugging? And, and you need to realize how gross it is in the position you're in. And you need to push the devil away and then run to back to Jesus Christ Amen. and say, God, I love you. Amen. And what you need to do is right now, you, some of you have your arms wrapped around the devil right now. You got depression, you got nitpickiness and laziness, poor time management, indifference toward the things of God, neglect of spiritual duties, sin, people, poor health care, and satanic attacks from suffering. You got those things embracing you and you're embracing those things. You need to push those things away right now off of your seat. Run down the aisle where Jesus Christ is on the altar at Calvary and say, Jesus, I love you. Amen. Amen. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. Feel free to come down here forward on the altar's floor if the Lord has let it upon your heart. We don't make people come. We want to do what's between you and God. If you want to pray on your seat, that's fine. But if the Holy Spirit wants you to come, then don't hesitate to come. Whatever the Holy Spirit's leading on your heart, spend that time praying to Him. You need to push away that ugly, wicked son of Belial. You allow strangers in to eat your steak. And you need to say, hands off my steak. You haven't been happy lately. You haven't been enjoying the blessing of God. You haven't seen God answering your prayers and moving mightily in your life because you always surrendered the fat parts to depression, to poor time management, to sin, to attacks from Satan that caused you suffering. You let your husband, your wife, your children, your best friend and your so-called friends, you allow people to rob your steak. You let busyness rob you of your steak. You need to say hands off. But it's so hard, Pastor. You know why? Because your emotion of love is growing toward it. You're seeing the attractive side of it, the beauty of those ugly things. You need to start switching those emotions. Switch the button and say, I hate it. It's hard, it's hard to fall into sin when you hate it. If you have such a great disgust and hatred toward it, it's so hard to fall into that. You need to remember who you love and you need to remember who you hate. We don't want to rush people. If you want to spend time praying to the Lord, please keep praying where you are in your seat or on the floor. The rest of you, please take out your white hymn books. The rest of you, please take out your 
white hymn books. And if you'll please stand, please stand. Uh, excuse me, your red hymn books. Excuse me, your red hymn books. And please stand. Please stand. We can't allow things in our life rob us of our time, rob our love for Jesus Christ. All right, if you'll take out your red hymn books and we're going to sing is your all on the altar and I hope that you've laid it all on the altar to him and let him take full control in your life 381 please 381 381 oh how you've longed for sweet peace that steak that fat part of the steak and you never got it because you allowed strangers to come in we will sing verse we will skip verse two we will skip verse two here we go you have long for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly fervently prayed but you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all of the Does the spirit control? You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. Oh, we never can know what the Lord will bestow of the blessings for which we have. Till our body and soul He doth fully control And our all on the altar is laid Is your all on the altar A sacrifice laid Your heart does the Spirit control especially time is so short in these last days. Yes, that's good, good man. There, this is no time, like Pastor said, this is no time to go malnourished. Now more than ever is a time where we need the meat, Lord God. We need the meat of the right doctrine that, that you've, you've brought to us by us being in this church. We need the meat of the joy of our salvation. And we need the meat of knowing that we're doing the right thing and that we're honestly close to you and trying to live for you and serve you, Lord. I pray, Father, that 
all those that were here for this sermon and that saw it online, Lord God, that this wouldn't just be another Sunday preaching. But this would be something, Lord, that could revive us individually so that we could start to enjoy the blessings that you've had right in front of our face for so long that we just refuse to, to put to our mouth and to enjoy, Father. I pray that you would bless this sermon, really have it to stick with us this next week as we go into the world. Don't have the devil come and eat that meat as soon as we leave, Father God. Don't let us just throw it in the trash. Have us to really spend some time and enjoying those blessings, Lord. I pray that you would bless the teaching, the rest of this service, Father. And uh, we pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you. <laughs>